The story we're about to hear is one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament. God has called Abraham to leave his home and his family in exchange for a new home and a new family in Canaan. God has promised Abraham that he would be the leader of a nation, that he would have a son who would inherit the nation and carry on the family line. His wife, Sarah, was not able to get pregnant for many years, but by a miracle, she finally did. Their son, Isaac, was a long-awaited gift. In this story today, we will hear God command Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, only to spare him at the last minute. Listen for where God is present in this story. From the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. I've never been much of a risk taker. Never been one to make a decision without at least 10 pro-con lists and consultations with dozens of trusted friends and loved ones. I'm told that when I was a toddler, I would carefully lay out all of my Fisher Price Little People dolls, inventorying and categorizing them on the playroom floor. I wanted to know all my options so that I could make a completely informed decision about which one to play with. I still like everything to be so calculated, so predictable, that I don't often leave a lot of room for spontaneity. I mean, who needs surprises when you have a plan? A friend of mine is the utter opposite of me in this respect. 
After high school, she took a year off, having adventures out on her own in London and South Africa, while most of us were moving into dorm rooms and declaring our majors. She once took a several, several week long road trip around the country, staying on couches with friends and with strangers and going to every music festival she could afford. And most recently, after graduating from college, she took her economics degree not into banking or consulting, but she used that expertise to open her own food truck, which after six months has been rated the best falafel in the city of New Orleans. People told her she was crazy, that her plans would never work out. Almost nobody thought that opening a food truck was a good bet. But she was convicted that her unconventional path was the right one, and she took it, and it worked. I think we all love to hear stories like this because it's so rare that someone really goes out on a limb and risks everything on such an unlikely gamble. It's so much easier to do what's expected of us, to follow a plan, to make responsible decisions with a good outcome pretty much guaranteed. When we hear about someone going rogue and doing the unconventional thing, especially when they succeed, it makes us feel like maybe we could do something like that one day. Like maybe the world is a little bit bigger, a little bit more exciting than we thought. But even the risk my friend took to start her food truck really only impacted her. If she failed, it was her mistake to clean up her own life to figure out. But when Abraham brings Isaac up to the mountaintop, he's taking a risk that's about more than just him. God commands Abraham to sacrifice his own son, but God also promised Abraham an heir. Abraham is betting on God's promise, and the wager is his son's life. I don't have any kids of my own, so I can't claim to understand how Abraham felt, but I can only imagine that any parent would be horrified to make that kind of bet. Abraham could have said no to God's command. I find myself wanting him to say no. He could have told God that there was just no way he would sacrifice his son. But instead, he decides to take the gamble. He decides to head up the mountain with Isaac, inexplicably faithful, as he tells his son that God will provide the lamb. But what does that even mean? As far as we can see in the story, God has already provided the lamb, and it's Isaac. So what exactly does Abraham think God will provide when they get up there? Will God provide a way out of this terrible catch-22 where his choices were saying no to God or killing his own son? Abraham takes a gamble on God's providence. And in the process, it's not just his faith on the line, it's also the life of his son. And this is what feels so profoundly disturbing to us about this story. The God seems murderous and evil. What kind of God commands the killing of a child? What kind of God would demand such a violent, terrible act as proof of someone's faith? And there's also God's promise that's at stake here. God covenanted with Abraham, promised him a nation and an heir who would carry the Israelite people into new generations. What kind of God would break a promise, especially one so substantial and important? This doesn't sound like a God I would want to believe in. This is not a pleasant image of a loving creator or benevolent savior. This God is terrifying. But what if we tried looking at the story in a different way? As Abraham and Isaac depart from their servants for their final ascent up the mountain, Abraham says, we will worship and we will come back to you. What would change about the way we see this story if Abraham knew he was coming back with Isaac? That whatever happened on that mountaintop, Isaac wasn't going to die. What if Abraham saw how God had followed through on past promises 
and trusted that God would follow through again? What if Abraham, just like us, doesn't believe in a God who commands the killing of children, doesn't believe in a God who breaks promises? What if all along Abraham was making a good bet? A week ago, our group of 40 high school youth and adult chaperones returned from our work camp trip to Kentucky. It was a deeply meaningful experience for me to get to chaperone, having gone on three work camp trips myself as a high schooler in this youth group. On work camp, the youth work hard and serve the communities they visit. And they also have a lot of fun playing goofy games and listening to music and joking around with each other. But my favorite part of work camp comes in the evenings when we gather for circle time. It's a sacred space where we share experiences from our work site, our deepest feelings, our hopes and fears that are too scary to share in most places, but can come out in this safe, sacred, loving space. It takes preparation, though. We don't share our life stories the first night. Taking the very real risk of sharing something so personal requires testing the waters, sharing in small ways, feeling out the group, gaining the comfort level that makes sharing feel like a good bet. Looking back at Abraham's narrative, we see him preparing for his risk, too. God asks Abraham to leave everything he knows to start a new life in a land he's never seen. He follows God's command and everything works out as God promises. God tells Abraham and Sarah to be patient and they will have a son. And as unlikely as that sounds, they are patient and Isaac is born. Just like the high school youth on work camp learn to trust one another measure by measure, Abraham learns to trust God through experience. But no matter how much preparation we have, no matter how much assurance, risking is still hard. And it's still scary. It's hard to trust what we can't see or know. If we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times it's a whole lot simpler to trust ourselves or to have faith in our own carefully thought out decisions than it is to trust that God will provide. Because that would involve letting go of the idea that it's possible for us to know everything, that we know what's right, and that we can reasonably predict the consequences of our actions, that we can explain everything that happens in the world. There's a phenomenon that some cancer survivors talk about. They say that their most well-meaning friends and family members will actually ask them what they did to make the cancer happen. They'll ask them if they drank too much diet soda or exercised too little or exercised too much or slept too little or slept too much or had some kind of beef with God and the list goes on and on. I think we do this because we need an explanation. If we can't pin a cause on the terrible things that happen to other people, then we have to acknowledge that those things could happen to us. No matter what we do, no matter how many good choices we try to make, some things are simply out of our hands. So we can plan. We can make our pro-con lists and five-year goals and try to orchestrate our lives so that they'll work out just the way we want. But sometimes we can't make an informed decision. Sometimes we won't know what the right answer is. Sometimes we just have to step out in faith. Against the decision that makes sense, against all traditional wisdom, against whatever anyone might have advised Abraham had he asked, he goes up the mountain with Isaac. And he returns with Isaac too. God blesses Abraham for his faith, blesses him for having the courage to do something that seems totally foolish. But Abraham's faith is so strong that he does the foolish thing anyway. What blessings might be waiting if we took a chance and stepped out in faith? 
What could happen if we took a risk and fought the status quo to stand up for something we believed in? If we risked being called fools for standing in solidarity with the oppressed and downtrodden, for fighting for equal rights for all, for doing what is inexplicable by every sensible measure, but that somehow we feel is right. If we pursued a long forgotten dream, if we put reason aside and took a chance. It probably wouldn't be easy, and it definitely wouldn't fit neatly inside the status quo. It would be risky. We'd probably feel foolish. But we might accomplish things we'd never imagined. Our lives might go in directions we could have never dreamed up for ourselves. And we'll never know unless we take that risk. Plans aren't all bad. God calls us to be discerning, careful, thoughtful, and cautious. But God also calls us sometimes to take risks, even when the risk seems foolish even when we're not sure what the outcome might be, because we never know what might be a good bet. Amen. <laughs>